there, right there, the red one. Yeah. <laughs> okay, next we have John Waldman, who will be talking about uh, gene flow and divergence in fish species in a Mongolian rift lake. Well, good morning. Uh, I know we're in um, the Hudson Valley, so why Mongolia? Well, one reason is that the theme of the conference is fish on the move, and uh, we've looked at fish on the move in many ways yesterday and today, but not in terms of a recolonization of a deformated water body, uh, which I found pretty interesting. So this work was uh, done by a team of people, including my um, undergrad, uh, Ivana Roman, a couple of postdocs, Olaf Jensen, who actually organized the big Mongolian initiative, and uh, a colleague from Queen's College. Uh, and the work occurred regarding Lake Hulsgol and the Egg Ur River system here. Now, Mongolia is a really interesting place. It's twice the size of Texas, but it has the population of Brooklyn. And half the people live in a little <coughs> basin of the capital city, Ulaanbaatar. So there's not much out there except steppe and some goats and sheep. And uh, it has one of the most interesting watersheds in the world. Uh, at this end is Lake Baikal, which is famous as a cradle of biodiversity. It has uh, many, many endemics. It was a former marine sea. It has a quarter of the world's fresh water. And uh, it has about 65 fish species, of which more than half are endemic. Lake Hovsgol, at the other end of its watershed, is an incredible contrast. It's also one of the world's great lakes. It's the second largest lake in Asia in terms of water volume. But it has 10 fish species, of uh, which none are endemic. Both were glaciated, and both uh, deglaciated after the last glacial maximum about 15,000 years ago. But it's just a contrast in diversity. Between them is the Egg Ur River system. The egg comes out of Lake Hovsgol and then uh, joins the Ur and becomes a Selenga, which feeds into Lake Baikal. Hallsdow itself does not have any major tributaries. The egg is a fairly good-sized river coming out of it, but the tribs that come into it are actually quite small. And when I drove around part of it in the summer, some of them were dry. So that's important in terms of uh, the question of refugia. And these are the species we looked at genetically. We looked at the Burbick, Arctic Railing, Lenick, Eurasian Minnow, and Stone Loach. Hofgal was an incredible experience because most of Mongolia is very dry. You come from the steppe country where you're passing camels, you go over a ridge, and suddenly you're in Switzerland. It's, the air is ice cold, the lake is ice cold, the lake is ultra oligotrophic. You can see 60 feet down. There's very little uh, production there. It's actually a, a beautiful place, too. And we were there mainly for taming. I'm smiling like a fool because that's my, my biggest taming of the trip. Uh, we were working on TAME in, in a number of different ways, but I piggybacked this genetic study onto the, the project. And TAME are amazing fish. They can reach over 200 pounds. They're kind of like crocodiles in the rivers. I'll show you why. Here, here's a uh, fishing flea market. Give me a couple of minutes for a travel log. Uh, this is a fishing flea market in Ulaanbaatar, and this is not a joke gift. These are rats with, with treble hooks because fishermen will take them and shove them across the river and Taman will come up and grab them. Taman are famous for grabbing waterfowl and, and rodents and uh, this is what the locals fish with. So the species of question, uh, this is the Lenach. The Lenach is a very cool salmon. It has a subterminal mouth and, uh, and yet it's fearless and it takes dry flies and surface food and uh, we found a mouse in its stomach so they, they are like Taman. They go for whatever they can get. Uh, they're kind of like Dolly Varden. They just have no in inhibitions. Here, give her fish for dollies. Uh, these are grayling that are found in the river and the lake. In the lake, there's evidence of subspeciation. There's evidence that there's an inshore group that feeds on insects and an uh, offshore group that's more pelagic and more of a filter feeder. That's a little bit uh, controversial. What I found about these grayling is that they're generally a lot slimmer than the ones I've seen in Alaska. We also had looked at burbot, and there's some large burbot both uh, in the river and the lake. We looked at a foxinus minnow. Sorry for the poor photograph, but it's your basic little foxinus type minnow, and the stone loach. So we had a wide diversity in terms of uh, evolutionary history and life history habits, and we were interested in you know how, when did this lake uh, become recolonized? The difference between Baikal and Hulsgol is that Baikal 
maintain this endemism, and it's believed that there were refugia that uh, fish survived in, other species survived in, whereas Hull's gull seemed to have been completely glaciated. And if you look at the sediments, about 13,000 years ago, there is no evidence of any life having rained down into the sediments. So it, it's believed that it essentially shut down. We started out in what was called Taman Camp, which is here on the banks of the uh, Ur River. Uh, the camp is right above the floodplain there. It looks a lot like the American West. And we traveled in Fergones. This is the coolest vehicle. It's a Soviet-made vehicle. It looks like a Volkswagen van. The good thing about them is they can drive through anything. The bad thing is they break down every 10 minutes. Uh, but the Mongolians know how to, they have duct tape, and they, they do a good job. <laughs> uh, this is Taman Camp being open when we first got there. It's a long-term project that Olaf Jensen and others have been involved with, Brian Wydell too. We slept in gears or yurts, which are wonderful structures. You can set them up and break them down in about 45 minutes. And I have to mention this, at the end of our successful river phase, we celebrated with what's called the Bodog, which is a um, celebration based around taking a goat and emptying out its innards, having a skin in, in which you then put in meat and potatoes and hot rocks and shake it and water, shake it around, let it off, and then at the end, so that you can eat the skin, you blow torch the skin, the, uh, the hair off, and then you open up the goat and you see rocks and potatoes and meat, and it's not spiced and it's not very good, but it was still the, <laughs> the, the best celebration I've ever had in my life. We, we had a blast. Um, we did the work on the lake with this old Soviet vessel that was dragged somehow over land from I don't know where. I never heard the full story of how that boat got there. But it was decrepit, but it still works, and it got us around. That's a yak. And we used coalescent analysis to work on these fish. We had samples from the river and from the lake. And basically, I'm not going to explain coalescent analysis in detail, but you, you have the uh, current genetic profiles, and you kind of walk them back in time to see where they might coalesce. An example of this is humans and chimpanzees. You can do coalescent analysis and work backwards and find out that they diverged about six million years ago. So we were using that same approach. And looking at the network analyses with split tree between the uh, Lake Hallsville samples and the Agora samples, what we found was that there was clear differentiation, but it wasn't really pronounced, but it was there. For stone loach, minnow, and lenach. For grayling and burbot, uh, burbot showed a little reticulation. Grayling showed serious divergence. So we, we think that they have uh, shown the most differentiation. Using structure analysis where you don't um, we basically let the data speak for itself and tell you how many groups there are. We found fairly strong uh, differentiation among grayling from the lake and uh, the lake here and the river here. Uh, same for burbot, same for stone loach, uh, but not so much for minnow and lenach. There was more evidence of, of what well, was less evidence of structure, serious structure. Also, using the coalescent analyses and looking at a number of different parameters, um, here's uh, isolation and migration model, H for Osgo, EU for Egbert. If you look at the ancestral population size, we found that uh, we had the largest ancestral population size for Burbot and Stone Loach, and the least for Grayling. For current population size, we found that the Lenach uh, had evidence of the largest like the population size, and uh, the uh, burbot was fairly large too in, in the minnow. In the time since divergence, we found that uh, the grayling and the minnow had the greatest time since divergence. And that's important. I want to come back to that in a moment. The other three kind of clustered around the same timeline. And then for the effective migration rate, we found the uh, greatest amount for the lenach and the minnow. So, with those different life history patterns and, and uh, you know, different evolutionary pasts, we found a considerable range of, of results. You know, the possibilities were that all these fish kind of behaved the same, and they came from what we think was the refugium of the Egger River and moved in simultaneously, or that they had very different life histories and, and, and histories in general, and we're seeing evidence of very distinct histories. So the major findings, uh, 
we found significant genetic different, differentiation for low five species in the lake versus river. Only the grayling had higher effective population size in the lake than in the river. And that kind of makes sense because we found that in the open lake there actually were fair numbers of grayling swimming in the pelagic levels, probably feeding those oplankton over a large part of this gigantic lake. I mean, it's like being in the ocean when you're in this lake. Uh, so I'm not surprised that the grayling had a larger effective population size. We found that the colonization of the lake by burbot was estimated at about 3,000 years ago, and the stone loach, about 3,000 years after the last glacial maximum, and the stone loach about 13,000 years after the last glacial maximum, followed by lone gene flow. So they got in there fairly recently, but once they were there, you did not see a lot of exchange between the river and the lake individuals. Uh, Lenick colonized also around the same time as the Stone Loach, about 13,000 years after the last glacial maximum, but it was followed by high gene flow and the lowest level of genetic differentiation of all the five species. Uh, and then we found that minnow and grayling predate the last glacial maximum by 15 to 30,000 years, which creates a conundrum because we believe the lake was totally, you know, essentially dead. Where did they come from? Now, of course, this could be an artifact of, of something, but we're not seeing evidence of that. So overall, the life history traits appear consistent with the patterns that were discerned. The minnow and the lenic had the highest gene flow, but they were also the most, uh, what I would call, habitat generalists. It, the agura system is basically pool and riffle, and we found the minnows pretty much everywhere, either in the pools or in the backwaters of the riffles, and lenic are pretty much everywhere, too. Burbot, grayling, and loach showed lower gene flow, but they're more of habitat specialists. In the river, we, I didn't talk about how to collect the fish, but we, we used angling, we used uh, seining, we used uh, electrofishing, and uh, trot mining. So we had to trot line the burbot in the river from the deep pools, because that's the only place you would find the burbot. So they, they don't seem to be all over the river in the same way some of these others are, which might lend it to lower gene flow. And the same thing for the grayling. They like the riffle habitat and the loach were found in the side channels. Um, the one interesting contrast between all four species and the grayling was that we saw evidence of greater river to lake than lake to river uh, exchange, which is consistent with lake specialization. We believe those grayling that came from the river evolved to become plankton feeders and it's less likely those fish would then be successful moving to the lake, to the river, because it wouldn't have those kinds of plankton populations. So we saw an asymmetry in the uh, movements of railing from river to lake and lake to river. So some outstanding questions. How do we account for uh, the minnow and the lenic predating the um, period of the last glacial maximum? Well, there's two possibilities here. One is a two steps model where they uh, moved in earlier and then later from the same source. The other is that there could be a two sources model. It could be that we are mistaken in believing that the lake was totally shut down and there was no refugium around the edges. You know, it's possible that there were some watershed changes and some unknown refugium that allowed them to get, um, survive this period. Uh, of, of heavy glaciation, and that those species came from somewhere else, and the others came from the egg where, uh, at this point, we can't differentiate between those two possibilities. Also interesting is that the egg or and the salanga have 12 species that are not found in the lake. And uh, one question that came to my mind is why no taimen or pike? Taimen are a riverine species. They're slinky. They, they act like crocodiles in these rivers. Uh, but they, there are anadromous populations in Eastern Asia that go to sea. And uh, so they, they don't have to be moving water, but they're not in the lake. And pike were not common, but they're found in the river too. In fact, uh, my colleague caught this beauty while we were there. And uh, so I, I'm speculating that this lake is so oligotrophic that in fact there may not be enough room at the top of the food chain for these, these uber predators. Uh, and that's just total speculation, but uh, that's the best I can come up with. Another question is, has the Lake Hulk Gulf fish community actually reached equilibrium? You know, we're talking 13,000 years ago. There's 12 species that are not there. Are we still in the middle of a recolonization process, you know, looking over a long time span? So it was an interesting uh, 
forensic analysis of a recolonization of a, of a you know, really amazing lake. And uh, I think we made some progress in figuring it out, but we didn't get all the way there. Thank you. Any questions?